All on TV today. You're going to be busy watching TV. Yeah. Good morning, church. Good morning. Good morning. The sun poked us, poked out for a second, but at least that, like, icy stuff quit. <laughs> so happy for that. Well, if you're watching online, please jump in the, uh, the feed there and just tell us hi so we know you're there. Uh, I'd love to see who all is joining us this morning. Um, this is an announcement that is not in the announcements because it was like a <clears throat> last minute thought about 45 seconds ago. <laughs> so back on the table, there is a basket. And um, Denny has started doing these and I think they are just so cool. He's And he's rebranded. <laughs> and so they are rocks and they've got a little picture on and each one's a little different and but on the back side of this one that's why i grabbed this one because this is the one that actually they all, they they all, all do have that. okay they all say jesus rocks on the back of them and that's jesus so. rocks or jesus rock <laughs> it's got double meaning yeah but these are free for the taking so oh. hang on a second i gotta put this one in my pocket and leave it there there we go all right can you believe we are almost to the end of Lent? We start Holy Week next Sunday with Palm Sunday. But this Wednesday, before we get there, we've got another lesson from our In the Footsteps of the Savior uh, Bible study series, which is, so on Sunday we're doing the, the, basically the short, quick message to get you interested, and then on Wednesday night we're pulling you in and digging deeper with it. So we invite you to join us 7 o'clock this Wednesday, uh, right here. And uh, we'll have it, the lesson, and then following the lesson, we'll go into a time of prayer. And I'm not sure how this happened because it was just a moment ago. It seems like yesterday I said, oh, we, we've got weeks before this. But this coming Saturday, uh, several of the men from church will be going to Iron Sharpens Iron in Davenport. Uh, we are, well, actually, Mark has already rented the 12 passenger van. And uh, so we'll be leaving here bright and early about 6.30. <laughs> Means I gotta get up on a non-work day extra early. That's all right, I'm looking forward to this. Going and getting uh, just renewed and hearing a message that will uh, inspire. And the best part is, is even though we've got the main sessions with the main speakers, we have breakup sessions throughout the morning and the afternoon. And for those, we'll get to choose what God is uh, directing us to hear. So I'm looking forward to that. So uh, keep us in prayer as we prepare for that. And then, as I said, uh, next week is Palm Sunday. We will have palms. Uh, and so looking forward to that. It's always a neat thing uh, when everybody's got their palms and they're waving them during the service. So, And then the following Sunday is Easter. And it just seems like Easter and Christmas come way back. And, we have, it's it's like March right now, and Easter is in two, two weeks from today, and then Mark and I will go, ah, we've got eight months until Christmas, and then like that, it'll be Christmas. So um, we invite you to join us for Easter. Uh, we'll be breaking the Easter fast with a meal served before the service, so we'll have breakfast. So we invite you to join us for that. We're looking forward to doing that with you. And then uh, also coming up, all this all at once, we have April's races on the 8th of April. So uh, for Orange Track Racing. So we're looking forward to that. It's going to be a busy couple of weeks coming up. Uh, busy couple of weekends. And so we look forward to that. And, you know, it, it just is so, I'm, all these things I've got a lot of hope for. I'm looking forward to them. And, What's today's message? Mark has a message for us today saying about, it's called following Jesus when you need hope. And so our call to worship this morning, oh, I forgot one. Men's breakfast. Our next men's breakfast is not in April, it is in May. Um, because we'll be gone the first Saturday to the, to the conference. So next time we, we will reset in here for a meal will be Easter for everybody. And then the men will have an uh, meal on the 6th. So looking forward to that as well. Did I miss anything? 
you know what it is? Is like I got all excited about the rock, <laughs> and not that rock, not the rock that everybody thinks about when you think about the rock. But well, as we think about hope, and I, I really like this passage that Mark has picked for our call to worship this morning. It comes from Titus two thirteen, but. Before we read this, let's go to God in prayer. Father God, we just thank you for the day that you've given us, Father. We thank you that uh, all of your blessings are given to us, Father, that regardless of what we're going through, that we do have a hope in you, Father, that there is something beyond anything that we can imagine. Father, when we look at the scriptures, we have a hope. We can go to Hebrews 11 and we can see all the hope that they had whether it was Noah or Moses or David or any number of the different uh, ones that are called out in there, and the ones that even aren't called out in there. We have a hope in this dark, dark world of ours, Father, where the Satan is trying to take over and he is trying to do things that is causing so much problems in the world. But regardless of it all, when it's all said and done, we have a hope that we will spend eternity with you, a knowledge that we will spend eternity with you. And so whatever we're going through, there is hope. Father, as we prepare to hear this word that you've given Pastor Mark this morning, we just ask that you, we would hear it and we would take it in and that we would use it as part of our daily lives, taking all these lessons that we learn whether it's in Sunday worship, or it's on a Wednesday Bible study, or it's our weekly reading, Father. That hope that we have in you is in all of that. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. So Titus 2.13 says, While we look forward with hope to that wonderful day when the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, will be revealed. I am thinking, I you know, up until he came the first time, they were hoping and waiting and ready for him to be revealed. And then what happened, we've talked about this over the past several weeks and even years as we've been preaching and teaching, is that those that should have known he was who he said he was totally missed the boat. He was revealed. So I know that when he comes back, there's going to be no doubt. Uh, uh, one of my mother-in-law's favorite songs is Days of Elijah and Jesus coming riding in on the oh, he's going to come riding in on the clouds and he is going there's going to be no doubt Jesus is here he will be revealed to us he will be revealed in the glory of God and we have a hope that we can look forward to in and of that as we get ready to hear this this morning Hold on to that expectation. Because with hope and faith, there becomes expectation. Prepare your hearts and your minds for what is to come. Father, thank you that we can hear this message. As we bring Pastor Mark up here, Father, we pray a blessing over him this morning and that he would give us a message that we can take out of here and learn from and use in our daily life. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, good morning, church. How's everybody today? This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Even with the stuff coming down out of the sky for a little while this morning, it's still a great day. We still have hope in our future. So I'm, I'm pumped up. I think this is a great time. So today we're going to talk about following Jesus when you need hope. And is there anybody in this room that needs hope? Mm, yeah, yeah, look around you. So hope is a four-letter word that really, really speaks volumes. So as we go through this today, you know, uh, I want you to think about hope and what we need for hope. Because what the scriptures tell us is that when we need something and we come to the Lord with our needs, he fulfills our needs. Not necessarily everything we want. He's not Santa Claus, so you can't go to him with Santa Claus list. But he will fulfill our needs. 
And so when we need hope, we need to make sure that we go to God first for that. So we hear a lot about hope. And it's mostly, I hope I can, or I really hope, dot, 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 fill in the blanks, whatever it happens to be. But really, that's not hope. That's a wish. And there's a real marked difference between the two. A hope is a feeling of expectation and a desire for certain things to happen. And so we need to make sure we understand that. There has to be a level of expectation, expecting something to happen in order for that to be hope. That is where the basis of hope comes from. Well, a wish is just a feel, a feeling or an expression. It's kind of a strong desire. Sometimes it can be a hope for something that's not easily attainable. And you know, wanting something that cannot or probably will not happen. So there's a marked difference between having hope and an expectation for something to be fulfilled and a wish, gee, I just wish this could happen and it may or probably won't happen. So there's a difference. Hope implies the expectation of something to happen, whereas a wish is just not going to come to be unless it does. So the two are not interchangeable. And when we think of hope, especially in a biblical context, it is an expectation based on a promise of something yet to come, something yet to happen. Now that gives us something to lean on, an expectation of better things to come, a hope for a better future, something we can build upon. We can't build upon a wish but we can build upon hope. And so I want you to think about that today. Because see, we have direct control over the outcome of a hope because we can build upon that expectation of a promise of things to happen. In other words, we need to do our part to receive what we have hope for to happen in the future. So when Jesus was traveling throughout that region of northern Israel around the Sea of Galilee, and it was about this time in succession throughout our Easter season when we think about these things. So he came to this hill that was overlooking the sea, and he and the disciples set up for a sermon on that hill and invited many, many, many people to come and attend. And as they traveled throughout that region, they had been witness to the many cruelties that were imparted upon the Jewish people by the Romans who were the occupiers of that entire region at the time. And so in doing so, they saw people with little hope and they were desperate for a savior to come because the prophets of old over a thousand years ago had told them and foretold of the savior to come. And see, the people were looking for that savior. They were looking for someone to release them from the bondage of the Romans. And so they kind of missed the point of why he was coming. They were wanting another Moses to lead them out of, uh, out of Egypt. They wanted that savior to come in and, you know, destroy the Romans. And that's what they were looking for. So while the Jesus and the disciples were traveling through the region, they saw all these atrocities. He witnessed crucifixions. He witnessed the people being beaten for really little or no reason. The Romans that were just driving the people into the ground, they had no money left. They had nothing to survive on because they were being taxed so heavily by the Romans. And if they dared complain, guess what? They raised the taxes even more. So when Jesus got up there and they, they come up to this hill and they've been invited all these people to come, Jesus in his sermon, which was arguably the greatest sermon of all time that he was given, he started out and he wanted to make sure that his sermon started out with a message of hope. He wanted some to give the people a foundation of hope to be able to build upon for the future, to be able to see that there was something greater than what their circumstances were that they were living in at this point in time. 
So he began with a message of hope for that gathered multitude that was there. And there was about 5,000 gathered there. So if we go to Matthew 5, he gives us that message. And it's called the Beatitudes. And that is the message of hope that comes ahead of what his Sermon on the Mount, the teachings that he wanted the people to understand. Because what he was teaching them at the time was, he was teaching them how to be a follower of Christ. So the Beatitudes start off, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, because they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. And blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, righteousness for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad because great is your reward in heaven. For in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. And these people he, he was talking to at the time, as a matter of fact, for each one of these items in the Beatitudes, it pertained back to each one of the people that he chose to follow him as a disciple. Each one of them had these traits. And so he was speaking not just to the people, but to his very disciples. He was calling them and saying, I have brought you into a purpose to give you hope, to bring you out of what you were living in before. And see, because he did that, these disciples then could relate to the people who were going through what they went through. And they were able to then minister to those people more effectively. But rejoice and be glad, for great is your reward in heaven. For in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you, you are now being persecuted by your occupiers. So he was giving them that vision of hope. That things are going to change. That there will be a brighter future. And we hear a lot about hope. But do we really understand what true hope is? True hope. Now this is the best example of true hope. That I can think of. Are the Beatitudes. Because he goes through and talks about the things. That are going on in the people's lives that day. And he says hey guess what. For everything you're going through here. There's going to be a better tomorrow. Have hope. Have faith. We will get you through this. See here Jesus meets them where they are. And gives them hope in the midst. Of the troubles that they're in facing. And if we truly believe what we read in the Bible. Then we should have that same hope. But do we really? Do we really believe what we read? Well. It takes faith to believe what we read. Ever think of it that way? In order to believe what we're reading in the Bible, in order to believe those passages, it takes a measure of faith to do so. So, faith and hope are intertwined intimately through the basis of our beliefs. Faith and hope go hand in hand. So if we read the passages in the Bible, we see a lot of times where we're talking about faith and we're talking about hope. And they bring those two things together to give them a better vision of the future. So I wrote about hope in my Advent message back in 2020. And I shared some of those insights from Pastor John Quigley, who wrote on hope. And they're some of the best that I've ever come across, so I figured I would... You know, kind of like to share some of those and intertwine a few of those in my message today. So writer and pastor John Quigley says, there's three basic types of hope. No hope, false hope, and true hope. And I think it's a very clear insight on its own. If you, if you just think about it just for a moment, there's a lot of times where we've felt in our own lives that we've had no hope. 
a situation that we didn't feel there was any way for us to overcome. And on our own, there probably wasn't. And then we have false hope. You put your hope in something that you, you really, really wished would happen to you, but it didn't. And then that kind of decayed your whole hope. And then there's true hope. And true hope is found in the Word of God. See, that true hope never fades. It never goes away. It was true 2,000 years ago, and it's true today. It stands the test of time. So based on our world today, we know that there is true hope that we can depend on, and it's found right in the Word of God. Titus 2.13 that I used for our opening today says, While we look forward with hope to that wonderful day, when the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, will be revealed to us. So what does that tell you by reading this? It says, hey, there's greater things to come than what you're facing here now. So what's it going to take for you to get there? Guess what it's going to take? It's going to take faith. It's going to take faith, and you're going to have to have that expectation of that greater thing to do that greater thing to come, that wonderful day when the glory of God, our Savior, will be revealed to us. So we got that expectation of really something gonna, great's going to happen in the future. Well, I chose this as my call to worship because this is what we should be aspiring to do in our lives each and every day. We're aspiring to a rebirth, a resurrection of ourselves. A restoration of our souls, a reclamation of our bodies raised in perfection on the last day. See, if we read that book, if we read that book, we dust it off and we read it, and we look in, and if you looked in what I posted this week on Facebook, I posted a section on Revelations. And in that section in Revelations, it talks about the old is going away and the new. Behold, the new is born. We have a new, a new earth, a new kingdom. We'll have new bodies. And we are going to be restored. What it promises is in there is we are going to be restored in heaven to what we had before. So, here's what it's all about. If we have not yet passed, then we will fall asleep and be awakened in paradise. You see, there's two stages to heaven. Paradise is our spirit being lifted to heaven to join with those who have gone before us. Lifted up into the presence of God. Heaven of the first part. And then on that glorious day, guess what? We're going to receive that resurrection. The reclamation, the restoration to glory. Now, if you remember, and some of you weren't here for it, I talked about what it was like in the Garden of Eden before the great deception, before the fall. And I talked about how there was no, there was no sickness, there was no death. They could have lived immortally forever because there was nothing there to, to keep them from it. God created a perfect place. That's why it's called Eden, a paradise. And so he put his greatest creation, man and woman, into that garden to take care of that garden and to tend to it. And that was to go on for eternity. But they fell. And so it's separated from the God. When Adam and Eve were in the garden, paradise was torn apart. They were separated from it. They were separated from God. And see... On that final day that we will be raised up into paradise and paradise will be restored to us God will be restored to us and that's called heaven of the second part and this is the basis of hope that we aspire to see it's not money it's not fame it's not fortune because none of those things will matter none of those things will matter they'll no longer exist and they're the basis for false hope. And then that leads to no hope when those things are gone. If we put our faith in, in money or fame or fortune or any of those things, they're fleeting. They're temporal. They won't last forever. But what does is the word of God. 
It's true. It's trustworthy. And always, always, it is never dependent upon circumstance. It is never dependent upon politics. It's never dependent upon the actions or inactions of men. And it was true then, it's true now, and it will be true tomorrow. In his word, we can find hope, joy, peace, and love unending. Unending. That's what we build our hope based upon are the promises of God, because that is what he's already promised us. It is ours when we have faith, when we have belief in Christ. He restores that unto us. He gives us that basis of hope for our future. And although I just mentioned that faith and hope are intertwined together, they should be clearly distinguished. Faith has work to perform today, whereas hope cheers faith along the way and points to that reward of service. Does that make sense to you? So faith has work. We Faith has a, it's a verb. You gotta go out and do with your faith. We don't wanna have faith and put it up on a, on a jar on, the, on, on top of the bookshelf. Faith has work to do. And hope is what cheers us along the way. It empowers us to be able to do those things that we need to do to aspire to, to get us to what our future should be. Faith comes by hearing the word of God. And that is told to us in Romans 10, 17. Hope comes from experience, Romans 5, 4. Faith accepts the gift of promise and hope confidently expects the fulfillment of that promise. So I'd like you to hang on to that one today. If you don't have notes, we got clipboards and everything if you want to take notes, but it's fun. The word of God says much more about hope, but it never does use the term to mean uncertainty or doubt. Uncertainty or doubt. It's wrong to use the scriptural term of hope to say, I hope I'm a, I'm a Christian, as much as it would be for me to say, I hope I'm, a, I'm an American. We know, we know what we are. I don't hope for to be something that I know that I already am. <clears throat> so let's examine those three classes in the world today in respect to their relations to hope. There are those who have no hope, those who have false hope, and those who have true hope. And according to God's word, there are those today who are described as having no hope. And that would be without God in their lives, without the promises that we just got done mentioning. There can be no hope or no basis for hope in the world. In Ephesians 2, 11 and 12, Paul discusses those who had no hope being without God in the world, meaning he, they had nothing to base their hope upon. They had none of those promises to base their future upon. So what did they have to place their hope in? It was meaningless, it was baseless. So while you may think there are those who have no hope based on what we've heard so far this morning, you may be inclined to believe it too, but to that I disagree. <laughs> Going back to what John quickly says, he says, hope is as essential to the human soul as faith is to society. A life without hope becomes an unendurable misery, a burden too grievous to be borne. God himself recognized the necessity of hope for the human soul. He built it into us. We have a need, a want, a desire for hope. To hope for something better to come. It is endured in our cells. It's built into our soul. In Genesis 3, after Adam and Eve had sinned, they were without hope because they broke that relationship with God and therefore were excluded from his presence. He wiped them out. Moved them out of the garden. They are on their own. God sent messengers and prophets across the generations to tell of that hope to come. And what did they do every time that the people would move away from what God had planned for them? What would he do? Make them wander in the wilderness, wouldn't get into the promised land. Once they got into the promised land, what would they do again? Hey, we're here. So back to what we used to do. 
And so what, what happens is God came up with plans of restoration. Notice his promises never changed. He didn't alter the promises. He altered the circumstances for the people to be able to get those promises fulfilled in their lives. God's word stayed true, independent of the people's actions or inactions. So when we look at society today and even more close to home, in our own circle of life, those to very small degrees of separation that we have, we must admit that there are still those who are distraught without hope, without God in the world. And sadly, unfortunately, even in this day and age, one of the major cause of death among teenagers is still suicide, stemming from that loss of hope. They lost the vision of hope. They lost that expectation of hope. Or they put their, their hope and faith and trust in something that was baseless at the time. See, and it doesn't stop there. We, we see a lot of this in veterans returning from home. And uh, Terry and I uh, do a flag retirement ceremony that I started way back when, I don't, can't even remember how many years ago, with the Freedom Festival. So every flag day, we, we do a flag retirement ceremony for all of the, the veterans, for all of the fallen soldiers every year. And we list out the names of each and every one of those. And unfortunately, we have so many of those names. When I get the master list in from the veterans groups, you know, I look at those and, and uh, they used to have on there what the cause of death was, and you cannot believe how many died from suicide. They come back and they just, they can't fit in anymore. They, they've lost their hope, they've lost their drive for life, and they give up their lives. And we, we read hundreds of names every year as we dedicate those. On this flag day, please join us again this year. We're, we're gonna honor those people who have fallen. So at that point in time, they've lost their hope and they've become lost in the world. And if they turn to the world, guess what? There are no promises of hope in the world, none whatsoever. It's a very dark place to be. So we as Christians, we need to reach out to them and tell them there is hope. There is more to life and life worth living. We need to share why we have hope in Christ. We need to share with them why we have a future which is completely away from this world. Completely away from this world. So those without hope need our help. We might be the only sight of Christ that they have in their lives. We might be their only chance. So our second group of people are those who ascribe to a false hope based on false teachings, based on things that just do not pan out. Scripture tells us what Jesus said in Matthew 7, 21 through 27. Not everyone who calls out to me, Lord, Lord, will enter into the kingdom of heaven. Only those who actually do the will of my Father in heaven will enter. On judgment day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, we prophesied in your name and we cast out demons in your name and perform many miracles in your name. But I will reply to them, I never knew you. Get away from me. You who break God's laws. And it goes on to say, anyone who listens to my teachings and follows it is it is a wise like a person who builds a, a house on a solid rock though the rain comes in torrents and the flood waters rise and the winds beat against that house it won't collapse because it's built on bedrock but anyone who hears my teaching and does not obey is foolish like a person who builds a house on sand when the rains and floods come the winds beat against that house it will collapse with a mighty crash. And I know we probably heard that since we were kids in Sunday school. I can remember, you know, we had to memorize certain verses and this happens to be one of them. But it's a, it's, it's a testament to those people and what God says is, hey, I want you to pay attention. I want you to understand what the will of my father is. 
And I want you to do the will of my Father. And if you do those things, guess what? I've got a great future for you. I've got plans for you to be with me. See, now this passage is both a stern warning of the consequences of false teachings and or shallow belief. And sadly, those who have false hope are more numerous and worse off than those who have no hope at all. They're not only found in the dark corners of Africa or the deepest jungles of South America, they're found right here in the midst of the information superhighway. Many who have false hope can be found right in our own communities. False hope, those who have false hope, are far worse than no hope at all. A person who finds himself hopeless with no hope at all may be inclined to accept true hope knowing they have nothing else. And they've hit that rock bottom as it may be. So they can only look up. And in contrast to that, the one who has false hope must admit their hope was in vain to start with before they will accept another. And that's a bad place to be. They got to admit that they were wrong. Nobody likes to admit they were wrong. And so they're inclined to stay in that, in that base of false hope. And they'll never get to that true hope. And again, it's our job to try and bring them out of that. False hope is truly just wishful thinking, wanting something they cannot have or probably will not happen for them. Have you ever heard anyone say, I can handle this, and then proceeds to fail miserably? That's false hope. That's nothing more than a wish. It had no good basis to start with. False hope seems to be self-sufficient until that time of testing comes. Many men and women have found that their hope was merely vanity when troubles arise. They didn't have any basis or any foundation. And that's what Jesus was talking about when he was talking about building your house on bedrock. You have a good solid foundation in which to build upon. And it will be long lasting and withstand the storms of life. So when he doesn't say those storms won't come at you, he's saying when they come at you, if you have that strong foundation, if you have that good basis of hope, if you have a good basis of faith, guess what? You will stand strong. You will, you will withstand those storms in life. And he will bring you through them. So many that have false hope are like that foolish man who built his house on the sand. It's merely wishful thinking that the alcoholic or addict who thinks they can quit at any time, they say, oh, hey, I can quit whenever I want to. See, that's false hope. I can quit smoking whenever I want to. That's false hope. The gangbangers are thieves who think they're above the law and they can steal and terrorize and kill without consequence. See, they've got false hope. The churchgoer who thinks that baptism, membership, coming to church, or doing good deeds is all that's necessary to get into heaven. See, that's also false hope. And as I said a few weeks ago in my message, there are those who believe in a second chance beyond our present life. They believe that repentance can be made one after one dies. Well, that's false teaching. And that's false hope. But unfortunately, you hear that coming from pulpits in certain churches who want to build that people. They want to tell them what they need to hear or what they want to hear, not what the truth is. And see, that's false hope. That's false teaching. False teachers are a plague to the church because they can easily deceive with false claims and mighty works. To recognize false teachers, the ordinary Christian must examine the life that they live and if they're living out their messages or not. Does their behavior and character conform to Christ and his teachings? Do they proclaim only what the people want to hear to make life easier and more pleasurable while ignoring the demanding and difficult requirements of discipleship? See, false teachers teach false hope. 
We never say that becoming a Christian and living a Christian life is going to be easy and that all your troubles are over with. I've heard that before. Nothing can be further from the truth. But what God does say is, he says, when you have those storms in life and when you come across those difficulties, when you come across those trials, I will see you through them. And if we look at what he's done and the examples that he's used of Job in the Bible, where Job lost everything, but he had restored to him twice over. He brought him through those storms of life, but he brought him out better than he was before. See, that's hope and a better future. Here in our own nation, we find strife. We hear hateful speech from all directions. We hear those who would take away the freedoms that our ancestors fought so hard to attain. We find, too, those who hate God and want to remove any mention of him from our society. And unfortunately, inside the church, there are also movements that would remove Christ from the Godhead. Make him just a man, a great teacher, but only a man. There are those who speak against the scriptures saying that there's parts that are untrue, so therefore none of it is trustworthy. This too has been tried over and over again in the history of the church. So I ask you, where's hope in any of that? Where's hope in any of those false teachings? Where, where does hope lie? There's also the word of God that says to us this truth. Jesus Christ is to be born into a place little known called Bethlehem the city of David in a time before he became king see giving us a message that there's a better way away from false hope away from no hope and away to true hope we have to grasp those stories we have to make them our understanding we have to understand what he means by these stories we know this to be the truth because it's recorded for us in documents outside of the Bible we know that Jesus lived and died and that he was crucified and that he rose from the dead. Even Titus Flavius Josephus, who is a Roman Jewish historian, mentions this as facts in his writings, which are outside of the Christian writings. He writes it in the Roman historical record. So they're not false stories. They're facts. The Bible tells us that if we are to be brought into the presence of the glory of God, it is through faith and belief in Jesus, the Son of Man, the Son of God, which is our hope. This is the basis for our hope. This is the basis for our understanding of our future. This is the basis for our life. As we approach Easter, a time in which we celebrate Jesus' victory over death, and the hope that we have because of his resurrection, we need to realize how God redefined love by sacrificing Jesus on the cross on Good Friday and how the resurrection brings hope on Easter Sunday. It gives us a way to rise up above all of the stuff that we have to live through each and every day. Jesus had to live through all those things. He witnessed all those things as a man, just as we do. So that he knows what we have to go through. And if Jesus can conquer death, which is the worst thing that can happen to us, then we need to trust him with our lives and our future and put our hope, our trust, and our faith in him. And as we begin to see things from God's perspective, he will rewrite our story with new hope and a new future. But we need to do our part. That takes belief. That takes faith. That takes prayer, and that takes having Jesus Christ in our lives. Not just part-time, but full-time. That is the promise of Easter. Something to hope for. That better future. In this Easter season, what are you expecting to happen? Is your hope of a better future built on a solid foundation of faith, or merely a wish that you could end up in heaven? It's a legitimate question. And they both have consequences. On Judgment Day, do you want to hear, Well done, my good and faithful servant, or be gone from my sight? I wish I never knew you. 
I'm expectantly waiting to see my father in heaven to hear him say, well done, good and faithful son. Welcome. Join our celebration. See, that's my hope. And I hope it's yours as well. Let us pray. Gracious Lord and Heavenly Father, we just praise you and thank you for uh, making it through this week and for being with us here today. Lord, we, we welcome you into our presence. We thank you for coming here. We welcome you into our hearts. Dear God, we come to, to you before you today and we feel weak and uncertain and we are struggling to find strength and courage to face the challenges that lie ahead of us. But gracious God, please grant to us the grace and fortitude. We need to endure and overcome those things that seem larger than life. Help us to trust in your plan and to know that you are walking with us every step of the way. Fill us today with your strength. Fill us today with your peace. Fill us today with your love. Give us the wisdom to make good decisions. We offer our struggles up to you today, and we ask that you carry us through these difficult times. Heavenly Father, we are in need of your strength and guidance to help us stay focused on you and not on our circumstances. When we feel overwhelmed and unsure of how to move forward, please give us the courage to face our fears and the determination to keep going. Help us to trust in your loving presence and know that you are with us always. Fill us with your peace, your grace, and give us the wisdom to make those right choices, to fill us full of hope for that future. Help us to be strong in body, mind, and spirit, and grant us the endurance to keep going, even when things seem tough. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for releasing us from our past sins and our mistakes. May we be filled with your love and your light, and may we use your strength to serve you and others with kindness and compassion. In your holy name we pray. Amen. something about your mental and physical health that through hope lifts you up. It is in this meal that we are about to share that we are given hope. As we prepare to celebrate this meal that Jesus did some 2,000 years ago. A meal that represents his return as well as his crucifixion. Because we have an expectant hope that he will return. Because what does he say at the end of this meal? Do this in remembrance of me. I will not eat of his bread or drink of his cup until I return. It was on the night that he was betrayed that he took the bread he blessed it, broke it, and told his disciples to take and eat. And as much as that was a symbol of his broken body on the cross, he then took the cup, a symbol of his blood shed for our sins. He said, this is the blood of the new covenant, my blood. shed for you. Take and drink. Father, we thank you for the hope that you give us as we share in this time of communion each and every week, Father. That we are reminded of 
your body which was broken on the cross and your blood shed and you did it all for us whether we turn to you and accept you as our Lord and Savior or not you came you were there and you continue to be with us guide us and direct us through with your remaining minutes, hours, days, months and years of our lives Well, good morning, everyone. Good morning. It's great to see everybody here this morning. So this is time for prayers for the people. And um, if anyone would like to ask for prayer for someone, I would love to pray for them. And this morning, I'm just going to thank God for all the prayers that have been answered in the last couple weeks. So is there anyone that would like to ask for prayer? I've got him in here. Yeah, I'm just going to keep praying for him. Like I prayed for my grandsons, they need help too. <laughs> so, is there anybody else? Yes, Lori. I have a friend that was in a car accident yesterday and is oh. in very serious condition. Oh no. <clears throat> okay. All right. Is there anybody else this morning? Okay. Well, I don't know about you, but some mornings I just have a really hard time getting out of bed and uh, or even praying or even knowing who I am in Christ. But he's been laying this song in my heart and um, it's, I've been singing it for the last couple months. And I hope you don't mind. I just want to I want to sing a verse and a um, chorus real quick. And it's called Blessed by Cain. And it starts. And if you know what, sing with me. Because it's a great song to remind you who you are in Christ. And it starts out. Trouble came knocking at my door today. I ain't gonna let it in. Worry tried to steal my joy away. I ain't gonna let it win. Because on my best day, I'm a child of God. On my worst day, I'm a child of God. Oh, every day is a good day. And you're the reason why I'm so blessed, I'm so blessed. Got this heartbeat in my chest. Oh, it doesn't matter about the rest. I've got you, Lord, I'm so blessed. And I thank you, God, for just being in my life. I thank you, Jesus, for being in the lives of all these people. For you give us a heartbeat. You give us our mind. You give us our bodies for us to take care of, Lord Jesus, and to worship you with them. So I just thank you, Jesus, and I honor you today. And I want to thank you for all the people we have prayed for and that you have heard our prayers, Lord Jesus, and you have given them new life. <clears throat> and you are healing them because you are faithful, not because we are faithful, but because you are faithful, Lord Jesus. And they have received miracles in their lives because of you. And first, I want to thank you for Marissa, who is receiving a miracle in her life as we speak. She is in her 20s, and she had a heart transplant. And as you recall, a couple weeks ago, I was praying for her. And um, her heart was, her body was rejecting her heart. And as we've prayed and other people have prayed, and you've heard their prayers, her body has turned around. You've given her new life. And the doctors knowledge to give her the right medicine to help her body to not reject her heart so she is healing and now she is home so we are so grateful and thank you for you thank you jesus for her life and we praise and we honor you god for that blessing we also thank you father god for emma my friend's granddaughter who last week spent three days in intensive care and um, then she spent two days in the hospital she had a terrible virus that attacked her body and her lungs. And you have breathed new life into her, Lord Jesus. And she is back home with her family and friends. And so we thank you, Father God, for this healing that you have brought for her. And we thank you, Jesus, for healing for Diane and her hand and her COVID that she has had this last week. We just praise you and honor you that you are healing her body and that Terry has not gotten COVID yet either. So thank you, Jesus. And we thank you for Steve, for my husband, who had shoulder replacement surgery. 
and it's been a long time coming since September, and um, he is on the mend, and we just thank you and honor you, God, for that. And we pray continually for them, Lord Jesus, that you will, you will lift them up and just keep blessing them and um, healing their bodies. We pray for Becky's mom, her cousin Steve, and her uncle Dean, all in need of healing, and we pray the blood of Jesus over them. And we thank you, God, for their healing by the power of your holy name, Jesus. We pray for Demetrius, Lord Jesus. Father God, wake him up. Open his eyes and mind. Hold on to Demetrius. Never let him go. Bring him into a right relationship with you, Father God. And we thank you for his bless for this blessing, and we thank you for his life, Lord Jesus. Just walk with him daily and help him to know that he is loved, Lord Jesus, and bring him back to you. And Father God, we, we um, ask for your um, peace and comfort over Wendy Walton and the Benish family for the, the loss of her brother Randy this week. And we just praise and honor you for their lives. And we just thank you, God, for you are so good to us. We pray for um, Doug, who was in a car accident this week. We just pray that you will be in that room, Lord Jesus, with him. And you will show him who you are and you will uh, heal his body, Lord God. Be with him and bless him. Help the doctors to know how to fix him if he needs if he needs surgically, re surgically repaired, Lord God. Help them to know. Give them wisdom, Lord Jesus, so that he will heal and learn to honor you. And we praise and honor you this day for hearing our prayers, O Lord. For you are Jehovah Rapha, our God who heals and restores. As it says in 1 Corinthians 16, 13, 14, be on your guard, stand firm in the faith. Um, be men of courage, be strong, do everything in love. For God loved us first. We must love one another as ourselves. Thank you, Jesus, God, and the Holy Spirit for life and breath in each and every day. In Jesus' holy name. Thank you. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Denise. We appreciate that. As we uh, draw our time to close here for our online portion of our service today, uh, we thank you for joining us and, and wish blessings on you in the coming week as we go to God and, and give you a closing prayer. Gracious Heavenly Father, thank you that you make all things new. Thank you for the victory and power in your name. And thank you that you hold the keys over death. And that by your might, Jesus was raised from the grave, paving a way for us to have new life with you. Thank you that you had a plan for us and that you made a way for us to join you in eternity and giving us a hope of that future to come. We confess our need for you to, re to refresh us and to make us new again. We ask that you would renew our hearts Renew our minds, renew our lives for the days ahead. We pray for your, for your redemption for us, for that renewal, for that restoration to come. Keep your words of truth planted firm within us and help us to keep focused on what is pure and what is right. Give us the power to be obedient to your word. And when the enemy reminds us where we've been, sending lies and attacks our ways, we trust that your voice speaks louder and stronger reminding us that we are safe with you and that your promises and plans for us will not fail. We ask that you would be our defense and our guard, keeping our way clear, removing the obstacles and covering the pitfalls, Lord, that would be before us. Lead us out onto your level ground. Shine your light in us, through us, and over us to be a light to our world. May we make a difference in the worth, this world for your glory and your purposes. Set your way before us. May all your plans succeed. May we reflect your peace, your hope, and your love to a world that so desperately needs your presence and your healing. Thanks be to you, God, for that indescribable gift of love, of hope, of faith, of grace and mercy through your Son, Jesus. To you be glory and honor on this day and forever. In your precious and holy name we pray today. Amen. Amen. Amen.
So some of the songs that I chose for today, as I always say, they, they're kind of a message in themselves. So if you don't know the songs, you may not be familiar with all of them, um, please just listen to the words if you can't sing the song. Um, because they, they should be a message into our souls as well. 